If you're watching this on YouTube, you might have noticed that this episode is a week delayed. But if you want to get early access to our episodes, consider becoming a paying member. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and share it with your friends. Thank you for all your support. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the second part of our Q&A series, The Poetry of Reality. I'm Taryn Southern. I'm a filmmaker and storyteller working at the intersection of science and technology. And we're here today with Richard Dawkins. And I am so thrilled to be back because we had so much fun on the first Q&A session. And I think we had a lot of great questions from the audience. So most of these questions were submitted via Richard's YouTube channel, uh, but also his social media channels as well. So please keep them coming in. Shall we jump in? Yes. All right. I love, this, I love this group of questions. The first one is, can you speak on the evolution of empathy in dogs toward their human owners? Dogs have been bred for a very long time to be empathetic towards their human owners, not deliberately probably, but just um, inadvertently. People have tended to love certain dogs more than others, and they've tended to breed from puppies that are friendly. As it happens, um, there was a, a lovely set of experiments done by a Russian group led by a man called Belayev, who's now dead, but they've con continued after his death. And uh, what he did, he actually worked with foxes uh, rather than wolves, which are the wild ancestors of dogs. But the principle is the same. Um, over a very large number of generations, they bred foxes and they bred them for tameness. So they would uh, deliberately choose those puppies, those cubs, as you call them, those cubs, which were the most friendly, the most uh, likely to approach humans, the least likely to attack humans, etc. And after many, many generations, they found that, actually not that many generations, they found that the foxes became tamer and tamer and tamer, uh, and more and more friendly. And not only that, they also became more dog-like in other respects, in that they looked more like dogs. They got floppy ears instead of prick ears. They got tails like dogs. They got uh, not plumage, whatever dogs have, um, coats um, like like dogs. Um, so that's a beautiful example in just in, in, in one human lifetime, showing how you can breed for tameness. Now that wasn't done deliberately by, by humans uh, seeking to um, tame their dogs probably, might have been uh, to some extent, but probably just an inadvertent thing. Some people have said that, suggested that actually dogs tamed us. I mean, that's another way of looking at it. But, but uh, anyway, Belayev's experiments are very interesting. That is interesting. And I'm surprised by the short duration of time required to yes. achieve that tameness. Why have we not necessarily, do you know why we haven't necessarily seen that in cats? Because I'm personally a cat lover and my little animal is quite feral at times. <laughs> Well, I think we do see it in cats as well. And um, I mean, cats are, of course, very different, famously so. You're either a cat lover or a dog lover. Um, and um, I suppose partly the reason may be that dogs are pack animals. Uh, um, and so they po possibly tend to generalize from um, the, the, the feelings of empathy towards fellow pack members to, to humans. In some sense, perhaps they think that we are members of, of the pack. That's fascinating. Okay, we'll move on to the second question. As a fun thought experiment, if you could choose two people to resurrect from the dead to contribute to society, who would you choose? Oh, I hate that sort of question. I never think of anything. Um, <laughs> um, let me think. Um, well, maybe Jesus, that would be interesting. Um, and he might be rather shocked by what he found among his followers, I suspect. Uh, I, he might um, remember the scene where he raged into the temple and, and upset all the, all the tables of the money changers. I think he might reenact that little scene. So that would be one. Yeah. Um, maybe Karl Marx to see what, what, um, what his followers have been up to and, and uh, perhaps do a bit of recanting. <laughs> That's great. Okay, third question. What is the point of music from an evolutionary perspective? Well, what's the point of anything? It has to mean something like survival value. What is it about 
uh, music in this case, or the, or the antecedents of music, which led to a greater chance of surviving in our wild ancestors? And that's a very difficult question to answer. It's equally di difficult to answer with respect to oh, all sorts of things like mathematics and philosophy and, and all, all the things that we do and which we value, but which don't seem to have any immediate value in terms of survival. Um, the only person I can think of who's actually thought about this question with respect to music is Steven Pinker uh, in, I think, I um, forget which of his books it is, probably How the Mind Works, where he puts forward what he calls the uh, cheesecake theory of music. Um, it goes something like this, if I can try to reconstruct it. We, our brains and our ears are geared to analyze sounds, especially for speech, because analyzing speech is a very, very complicated process of what mathematicians call Fourier analysis, where you, you, you dissect out the frequencies in the sound that's coming in and, and then reconstruct in the brain, in this case, words. Now, music, pure tones, for example, or chords or um, uh, me me melodic tones would sound, would be the equivalent of cheesecake. They would be a beautiful sound because whereas speech is rather complicated and requires a lot of analyzing, a pure tone or the sound of a trumpet or a violin um, all on one note or one note sustained for a reasonable amount of time would be a kind of luxury for the auditory system, the auditory brain system, which is used to analyzing complicated sounds. Um, you have to do a similar exercise for rhythm. And uh, it may be that rhythm came earliest, but with the rhythm of dancing, that kind of thing. Um, maybe it had something to do with rhythm, has something to do with perhaps the, the heartbeat, the, the the fetus hearing the maternal heartbeat or something like that. Um, these are all very speculative ideas. Nobody has really any idea, but Stephen Pink has come the closest to it. Anyway, his book, How the Mind Works, is a thoroughly recommended book, a brilliant book, as all his books are. Fantastic. And as a music lover, I certainly want to learn more about that. I think that's really interesting. Yeah. So despite the passage of time, advancements in technology and shifts in political and social landscapes, the fundamental nature of war and conflict has remained much the same. Throughout history, people have fought over resources, power, ideologies, all of this leading to destruction and suffering. Is there an explanation for it in evolution or in human nature or elsewhere? Do you think humanity can finally overcome the need for conflict and find more humane ways to solve our differences? Many animals show individual aggression, fighting against other individuals, but warfare is something really rather different. Warfare is uh, a group aggression. It may not even be aggression in the motivational sense. When you think about what the, the, uh, the, the motivation of, say, a person having a brawl in a pub is, and they feel, they see red, they lose their temper, they get angry, they, they lash out with, with their fists. That's individual level aggression, and that we see all over the animal kingdom, certainly all over vertebrates. But warfare is not really like that. Uh, the individual uh, bomber pilot does not feel particularly aggressive when he's uh, releasing bombs over a city. He's, he's, he's aiming, he's, he's using his skills as a, as a pilot or a bomb aimer, whatever it is. It's a very different psychological motivation. We do see something like warfare in chimpanzees. This was discovered by Jane Goodall, along with many other things about chimpanzees. Um, Intergroup fighting between uh, rival groups of chimpanzees, pretty ruthless stuff. And um, I think that might be a combination of individual level aggression and, uh, and kind of tribal level aggression. Um, throughout Anthropology throughout the study of um, human tribes throughout history, we see uh, plenty of intertribal aggression and intertribal warfare, often in the form of raids, uh, raids for cattle, raids for women, raids for territory. And so this is coming close to the sort of economic motivation, which uh, I think the questioner 
mentioned. Um, I think Resources. the sheer scale of human warfare does seem to be unique. Again, citing Steven Pinker, this time another book called The Better Angels of Our Nature, a more recent book, um, he traces human history and concludes on pretty good evidence, I think, that we're getting better in terms of the an, a, amount of killing that we do. It may not seem like that when you think about the dreadful wars of the second of the, of the, of the 20th century, but um, in the broad sweep of history, he shows that we are getting better. We're, you, we're, we're killing less. We're killing uh, fewer people. The, 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 the chance that a, a that a young man would die in battle, in combat, is much, much higher in tribal societies than it is in uh, modern Western societies. Even making allowance for the, uh, the terrible wars of, of, the, of the 20th century. Um, so I think the, we, we have some right to be a little bit optimistic. Uh, that things are sort of getting better slowly, but it's a zigzag course, it's by no means a, a uniform improvement. Do you think there's anything specifically that could, um, I, I suppose, affect that behavioral change in mass on humans to where that's no longer the lever that's pulled? Well, I think that we, we are getting more, our, our morality is changing. Um, when you think about um, today, when su such wars as, as we have today, when civilians get killed, it's often regarded as a kind of unfortunate byproduct. Whereas even a, a century ago, uh, in the First World War, um, well, the second, it's the Second World War, less than a century ago, um, killing civilians was part of what it was about. Um, and so, I think that our general moral compass is moving in the right direction, and. And even today, in the war between, um, in the invasion of, of Ukraine by, by, by Russia, the numbers of civilians who are killed um, is deplorable, but nevertheless is, much, is a much le less percentage than it used to be, um, say, in the Second World War. How would you define intuition-based decisions that largely hinder our logical approach? Do you believe in vibrations or body aura? that have also been practiced in medical sciences. I'm not sure about vibrations and auras. I, I, I don't go along with that at all. <laughs> I know, I, I, I thought those words used, I thought, mm, he's not gonna go for this. <laughs> yes. But maybe going back um, to the end of the okay. question. <laughs> um, the, the first part of the question, I think, I mean, the, the only literature I've read on that is is Daniel Kahneman with his fast and slow thinking and, and um, uh, I, it's an interesting book, and and I recommend it. Um, the the two, two different speeds with which we which we respond: the immediate, intuitive response to things, and then the the slow, logical response that comes along later. So, I, I refer the questioner to Daniel Kahneman, fast and slow thinking, and I rather I suggest that he gives up on, or she gives up on, auras and vibrations. <laughs> May I posit an additional? Uh, an additional statement that I, Please, I personally yeah. like to use. I live in Venice, California. So there are a lot of crystals. There are a lot of auras here. <laughs> There's a lot of that present. And something that I usually like to say when out and about with those types is the idea that magic is just science that we don't understand yet. And so if there are anything, if there are elements of our physiology, of our being, of the way that we you know, communicate with ourselves and with each other that we just don't have the right measurement tools for yet, but we will. Um, it's I absolutely still a agree with you. That... Spot on. I absolutely yeah. agree with you. I actually don't like the, the use of the word magic for conjuring because that, that seems to me to, to muddy the issue. I think we should try to revive the word conjuring for illusionists, for what, what people like Penn and Teller do, and reserve magic for mm -hmm. what doesn't actually happen. Um, and as you say, right. it's just what, what we don't yet understand. Um, I also use the word magic. I, I've written a book called The Magic of Reality, which uses magic in a different sense of, of being that which makes us feel moved, makes us, makes us feel almost spiritual. I mean, and reality, the poetry of reality, which is the name of this, of this podcast, um, 
that there is another sense of magic there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, and as someone who's working in neuroscience and seeing just how quickly the tools are evolving to be able to understand the actions inside the human brain. I mean, these are things that we didn't have 20, 30 years ago. And Quite. so we're speaking in a language now that quite frankly, 30 years ago would have been considered magic. Yes. Um, and so yes. I like to maintain that spirit and i think it also helps bring people who are maybe outside of the science world in quite well how far back would you have to go before a cell phone would be considered magic or a or a, an airliner magic or a computer magic i mean we, we we live in a in a magical world but it's all it's a comprehensible world because we've we've made it ourselves in human engineers have, have made it exactly every time on a, i'm on a plane i think this is magic <laughs> yes <laughs> wild Okay, moving on to question number six. Has the human body reached its peak? Can we evolve to be better without us interfering? Interesting. I don't know what that means by the without us interfering in the question. Oh, I think I do know what that means. Evolve, yeah. You know, there's a lot of people attempting to evolve themselves right now. Yes, that, that's a se separate part of the question. Um, have, have we peaked? Um, well, no, I'm sure we haven't peaked, but whether we ever will is another matter because um, the way evolution works is by natural selection, which means differential reproduction, differential survival to reproduce. So if you look at uh, the trend in human evolution, say for the past three million years since Lucy, since, since Australopithecus, what you see is she was already walk, walking on her hind legs. What you see since then is a great increase in brain size. So the questioner might be thinking, is the brain going to go on increasing in size as it has done over the past three million years? And that will only happen if natural selection favors increased brain size. In other words, if, if the brainiest individuals, whatever that means, the individuals with the largest brains are the ones who survive best and have the most offspring. And of course, there's no reason to suppose that they do in, in the modern world. Um, if, well, I, I won't comment on that, but, but, the, but um, it, that, that trend towards increasing brain size had to come about because in generation after generation, the brainiest individuals survived best or reproduced best. And that's not happening now, uh, far from it. So we're, not going to, we're certainly not going to, going to peak any further in that department. Now, if you look at what's changing, what, what looks like evolutionary change in humans now, of course, it's not, it's not biological evolution at all. It's um, cultural evolution, technology. We've just been talking about that in answer to the previous question. Uh, enormous strides in the environment in which we, which we have created for ourselves. Our modes of transport, our modes of communication, our modes of computation, um, all these are, if evolving is probably the right word because it is a, a progressive change in one direction, but it's not biological. It's nothing to do with genetics. It's to do with um, something, some other process which mimics e evolution, but goes perhaps a million times faster. So I think that's where we're going to be um, peaking, if anything. Now, the, the second part of the question was, are we going to peak without human interference? And now that, I take it that means something like um, genetic engineering, um, where one could imagine some future civilization interfering in human genetics and human reproduction to enhance the human body. And in principle, that can be done. You don't even need genetic engineering. That can be, that can be done eugenically, of course. Uh, it's never been tried or hardly ever, ever been tried, thank goodness. Um, but it's, it's something that could be done. You can breed uh, cattle for increasing milk yield. You can breed um, dogs for t tameness. We just heard about that earlier. You can breed horses for increased running speed. So there's no reason at all why you shouldn't, if you wanted to, breed humans for increased intelligence or increased musical ability or increased athletic ability. 
anything you like, as I say, it's never been done. And, well, the Nazis tried it briefly. Um, so that's one way to do it. Would be would be um, natural. Would be artificial selection in the same way as as we've selected dogs and cows and pigeons and and cabbages. Um, the other way would be interfering with genes themselves, genetic manipulation. And uh, that again is possible, not yet in any significant way, but in the science of the future, it, it will probably be, become possible to go in there and interfere with the genes of, a, of the next generation. And um, that, that's a very sinister prospect to many people. Um, it, today it could happen only, I think, in a sort of very minor way. Um, in in vitro fertilization, IVF, uh, it's common to inject a woman with hormones to make her hyperovulate, to produce, say, a dozen eggs, and then to fertilize them. And then at present, you pick one at random, one of the fertilized zygotes at random, and it reimplant it in the woman. That's random, but it doesn't have to be random. I mean, you could, uh, when you let it, if you let it grow in the Petri dish to the eight cell stage, say, it's then possible to extract one cell from the eight cell embryo and it analyze its genes and it doesn't harm it if you just take, take one of the eight cells. And so you could say eliminate, if you, if you know that this couple is at risk of producing a hemophiliac child, uh, or a, a haemophilia spreader, you could um, make sure that the embryo you choose, instead of choosing it at random, um, you choose one that does not have the haemophilia gene on the X chromosome. Um, well, that's pretty much already feasible. Uh, and, and that could be, I think that could be, I don't think anybody could really object to that. That would be a good way of el eliminating certain um, harmful genes, which everybody agrees are harmful, like haemophilia. Um, but then, of course, it, it might be only a matter of time before people start talking about picking out the one that's got a, 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 a Mozart gene, a, a, a J.S. Bach gene for, for musicianship or, or, or a, a, a mathematician's gene. That can't be done yet, but it may be possible to do it in the future. And then that may be something that civilization has to, society has to face up to the question of whether we want to, to encourage that or not. Many people would say no. Mm -hmm. This is all very interesting. You've talked about the sort of manipulation of genetics. What do you, what do you think about the more recent research around epigenetics and how that could play into this question? The idea that, you know, culture, choices, behaviors, um, uh, people's exposure to certain toxicities and things are actually influencing their genetic code and then... Yes, actually, I think that's a misuse of the, of the, of the word. It's, it, it's a very common one, uh, if I may say so. I, I think um, um, epigenetics is really the only... All it means is the differential expression of genes. And normally epigenetics means differential expression of genes within the developing embryo. So as the embryo develops, mm. it starts off as a, as a fertilized egg. And then as it develops, different tissues develop. And liver is different from kidney, which are different from muscle, which are different from nerves and so on. And that is due to epigenetic differences within the body. That's what epigenetics is. Now, just recently, there have been um, a certain amount of evidence that these epigenetic differentiation, which normally takes place only within the embryo, can carry over to the next generation. I think that's what you're referring to. Uh, and exactly unfortunately, the word epigenetics has come to, to be synonymous in people's minds with that carrying over to the, a subsequent generation, which I think is a, a misuse of the word. Um, so well, what I, do you, how I, do you... So sorry. what's the appropriate word? What would be the appropriate word for that? Well, no, it, it, it is appropriate, but, but it's... it's it's unfortunate that the word epigenetics has come to, to, to mean only that, whereas that's a very, very small part of what epigenetics is. Epigenetics is, is mostly differentiation within the embryo, which happens every single time 
a, a, a new a new tissue starts developing in the in the developing embryo. Okay, let's move on to the next question, which is centered on artificial intelligence. This question says, artificial intelligence can be considered a new life form. Do you think AI will also obey the law of evolution? That's very interesting. Um, it could do if artificial life starts to reproduce itself. And it can, that, that is a possibility. At present, it's all designed by humans, but there's no reason in principle why the procedure shouldn't mutate and evolve by some kind of natural selection. And some people, including Dan Dennett, for example, a greatly respected philosopher, are very worried about that, are very worried that um, artificial intelligence um, what he called counterfeit humans, um, hu humans that, you, that, that aren't real, but, but, but are il illusions that are put together artificially, and say on computer screens, um, and you don't know whether they're real or not. He makes the analogy with counterfeit money, for forged money. Now, they could evolve, they could indeed evolve um, by mutation that would just be seen random if, if they if they can reproduce then they can mutate change at random and that would mean that they could potentially evolve and become um very dangerous and he's very worried about this and um i i think i think he may have written something about it i, I recommend it if so i've um i've been talking to him about it um so that's one possible danger from artificial intelligence other people are simply worried about never mind whether whether it evolves by by darwinian means just just whether it could simply take over um without evolving and that's another possibility does he give any timelines in his book for this potential to um, happen? no but i think he thinks it's really rather imminent and and um he thinks that just as counterfeit money just as forged money is illegal he thinks that um counterfeit people should be made illegal for this reason very interesting hmm. do you think that rejuvenation is possible and if yes would you like to be young again <laughs> I would like to be young again. On the other hand, I wouldn't like to put back the clock and start again. I wouldn't like to go back to the age of 18 and have to write all those books again. I mean, that was a, a lot of work. Um, but if, if I could be myself but rejuvenated, yes, I would, I would like that. Um, I'm not sure that it's an entirely altruistic thing, though, because if everybody was rejuvenated, they never died, then the world would become too full and we have to balance that against um well i think it's obvious what, what, what i'm saying there well there are a lot of people right now attempting to reverse their age rejuvenate themselves all of yes, the above i, so I, I understand I that I, I i i i get i get that yes <laughs> is it possible for animals to develop consciousness over millions of years similar to the evolution of human brains well, obviously, yes, because it happened, it, it happened with, with us. But uh, the second question is, why do you think animals are not conscious? Um, there's, there's no reason to suppose that we're the only ones that are, are conscious. Um, we, uh, strictly speaking, each one of us is, is the only person who really knows we're conscious. I know I'm conscious and you know you're conscious, but I don't know you're conscious. I just believe you are because you're pretty much like me. You come from the same kind of source as me. And one can say the same kind of thing, but less strongly of chimpanzees. They, they come from the same source as us a bit further ago, but they have similar brains to us. There's no reason to think that they're not conscious. And it, it becomes a problem to know um, how many animals are conscious, but um, I would be, well, I can only give a personal opinion. It only is a personal opinion. I, I think dogs are conscious. And I think cats are conscious, and I think a lot of mammals are. Maybe all mammals are. Maybe birds, too. Um, so, th so, th so there's that. And even if they weren't, then the fact that at least one species of ape became conscious means that it can happen and probably would happen again if we weren't here. 
If we accept the assumption that there are intelligent aliens, is it possible that they look like us? How similar would they be? Science fiction writers who portray alien beings as being like us are often criticized for being naive and for being unimaginative. And the more imaginative science fiction writers uh, portray aliens as being utterly different, I mean, maybe gaseous rather than solid or, or that kind of thing. Um, at least one respected biologist, Simon Conway Morris, um, thinks that the power of convergent evolution is so great. If you look around the, the, the world, at, at the, for example, the Australian mammal fauna and the way in which the marsupial fauna of Australia has produced startling convergences to mammals in the rest of the world, like there's a marsupial mole, a marsupial mouse, marsupial flying squirrel, a marsupial rabbit, marsupial wolf, a marsupial cat, etc. Um, so natural selection, once it gets going, is very powerful in producing the same result when the needs are the same. Uh, there are striking, not just the Australian mammals, there are lots and lots of examples of um, convergent evolution. And Conway Morris, indeed, in one of his books, has, a, has what he calls a convergence index, where in addition to an author index and a subject index, he has a convergence index, which goes on pages and pages and pages, thousands of examples of convergent evolution. So evolution is capable of producing the same result in different places at different times. Um, and so he thinks that if there were aliens, it's highly likely that they might be rather like us. Um, some people have speculated that if the dinosaurs hadn't gone extinct when they did, when a, a meteorite hit Earth, they might have produced something a bit like humans, a, a bipedal, large-brained dinosaur. Um, so I think it's not totally silly to suggest that aliens might be like us. On the other hand, if the conditions on their world is very different, then that's another matter because if the gravity is different, for example, if, if gravity is much stronger, if they live on a, on, on a larger planet with the gravity, the gravity of, say, Jupiter, then they wouldn't be at all like us because, the, because the, the, you, I mean, if you're contending with a massive gra gravity, um, then you'd have a totally different body form. And similarly, if, you're, if there was a much weaker gravitational field, then um, we'd all be looking like spiders, daddy long legs, is, um, with these long spindly legs and, and things. But if, if there was a planet which had a similar gravitational field to ours and other similar con conditions to ours, if there was life at all, it seems to me not in inconceivable that they might be rather similar to us. Really basing that on the prevalence of convergent evolution. Very well said, thank you. What are the most intelligent arguments or thoughts that you have heard from theists, if any? <laughs> I think if any is a very is curious the operative word. I mean, I, I don't mean to impugn the intelligence of theists, but uh, I, if I rephrase that, not as the most intelligent argument, the most convincing argument, I don't think there are any. Um, <clears throat> If I were forced to choose one, and I'm reluctant to do so because when I've done this in the past, people have pounced on it and said, aha, Dawkins is a theist after all. Um, but if I were absolutely forced to choose one, I think it would be the, um, more, nothing to do with biology, it would be to do with physics, it would be to do with cosmology, um, to do with the um, apparent uh, fine tuning of the um, fundamental constants of physics. Physicists um, can calculate uh, about um, half, half a dozen or so fundamental constants, which are, which are numbers that they know the value of, but they don't know why. They don't have a rationale for it. What they do know is that if any of those constants were slightly changed, then the universe as we know it would not come into being. The things like the gravitational constant. The, the book about this, the best book I, I know about is by Martin Rees. Um, called Just Six Numbers. And he goes through six numbers and, and, and shows what, what the values are and why they have to be that way. And if they were slightly changed, if you could imagine that there were six knobs that you could twiddle 
in order to um, change the values of these constants, like the gravitational constants and the weak force, and weak nuclear force, and so on. Um, if you slightly change them, then you don't get a universe like ours. You don't get galaxies. You don't get chemistry. You don't get you. You don't get life. And so, um, some people have said that this looks as though um, the, one one person put it: the universe knew we were coming. Um, the the universe is t fine tuned to bring us into being. Um, I find that a very unconvincing argument um, in favour of theism. Um, but it's one that you will meet. Um, the probable, well, physicists differ in how they interpret it. I mean, so, some physicists say, well, we just don't yet know enough. We don't understand. We don't know why the fundamental constants are the other way they are, but perhaps they just couldn't be anything else. Um, other physicists, probably the majority of physicists, talk about the multiverse. The multiverse is not just something ad hoc, which is made up for the purpose. The multiverse follows from the inflationary model of the universe, which is the dominant one at the moment in cosmology. Um, and in the multiverse, you have a very, very large number of, of universes. Uh, all of them have different physical constants and different laws of physics. And um, we obviously have to be in one of the minority of universes that happens to have the right values of the laws and constants of physics in order to um, bring galaxies and chemistry, etc., into being. Um, because here we are. Uh, that's the anthropic principle. Um, and it's a question for physicists, really. But, but um, since you asked me the most intelligent argument that theists have advanced. I, th I think that's probably it. Um, biology is definitely out. Uh, un un uh, unlike what William Paley, the author of Natural Theology, said, he thought that physics was not a great field for demonstrating the wisdom of the creator, but biology was. Of course, he lived before Darwin. Since Darwin, biology is out as an argument for theism. Physics may still be the best hope they have, but it's not a very big hope. And they constantly retreat into um, little corners. Um, and um, my feeling is that since biology was the big one, which Darwin solved, that should give us confidence. The success of Darwin should give us confidence to, to advance into the field of physics and cosmology and, and do a, a, a Darwin there as, as well. But in, in any case, um, it, even if you grant all that, that if, even if you say it is a convincing argument, it's still not a good argument for a creator because you still got to explain where the creator himself came from, and and that is a, mm. a, a, that just pushes the problem back a stage further. So it's a very very bad arg argument, whichever way you look at it. Sure, I might add one additional in here, which you may not agree with, and I don't know that I would even categorize it as an intelligent argument. It's more of an emotional one. But I, I suppose it's one that I, I have some respect for, which is when I hear from someone, I understand that there's no evidence for my beliefs, and yet they just make me feel better. Uh -huh. And so therefore, yes. I am going to believe them. I feel better as a human being. Yes. Um, and I find that interesting. Right? We, we can't change someone's anecdotal experience. And if it makes it's them feel better, argument. and you're living uh, it. It's a terrible <laughs> argument. Um, you can't, you can't. You can't seriously argue that because something makes you feel good. Um, I think was, I keep, keep quoting Stephen Pinker, but but it, but he says something like, "If you're being attacked by a lion, it may make you feel better to to persuade yourself it's a rabbit, but it's not. It's a lion. Um, so face up to reality. Um, what makes you feel good is absolutely nothing to do with what's true. Right. It depends on how you're optimizing your life, I suppose. <laughs> oh yes. I mean, it, it it might make you feel happier. Yes. All right. Well, here is our very last question. Why were animals in prehistoric times so much larger than they are now? One of the things that scientists have to learn to do is to say, I don't know when they don't know. And I don't think I can answer that question. I'm not even sure it's necessarily true. I mean, it's true of the dinosaurs, of course, but the dinosaurs were just one example of very, very large animals, not all of them, but some of them. 
And so um, if you were to go back to the Cretaceous or Jurassic period, then indeed you would be confronted with uh, land animals, which are much larger than anything we see today. But that doesn't mean that animals in the past generally are larger than they are today. Um, I mean, mammals can be pretty large. Rhinoceroses are large. Elephants are large. There were prehistoric rhinoceroses that were even larger than elephants. Um, so I think the question should be more, why were dinosaurs so large uh, and larger than the largest mammals, largest land mammals, not the largest marine mammals, of course, because whales are probably larger than anything that's ever, ever lived before. Um, some people have said it's something to do with mammals being warm-blooded, but I, I don't think that's very convincing. It's not obvious to me why that should ha have that effect anyway, and many people nowadays think that dinosaurs were warm-blooded. So I don't think that'll do. And I think I just have to come back and say, I don't know. And uh, scientists ought to say, I don't know when it's true. I was just gonna say, spoken like a true scientist. So I would love to know, Richard, before we leave, are there any questions or ideas that have been occupying a lot of headspace for you right now? Because I think that might help our audience think of areas that they want to explore further in our future Q&As. Oh, gosh. Um, well, I'm, hmm, I'm just finishing a book called The Genetic Book of the Dead, which is coming out this time next year. And the last chapter of it um, is uh, suggests that it's helpful to think of all our own genes as though they were viruses. I don't mean that they are viruses that have joined into our genome, because that's true of about 8% of them. But I mean that um, there's something to be gained. It's, it's illuminating in some ways to think of our, all our own genes as though they were a colony, a sort of society of well, so certainly society of genes, but, but a society of viruses. Um, I don't think I've got time to expatiate on why I think that is helpful. So I just a, maybe just a plug for my book when it comes out next year. That's perfect. And we now have a seed planted. So bring questions about, about this exact thing. I'm excited to hear more about that. And as always, it's a, a pleasure to see you. And I look forward to our next Q&A for everyone watching. Please do send in your questions here on the YouTube channel or on or to Richard's social media channels. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. If you enjoyed this episode, you can show some support by subscribing to the podcast, sharing it with your friends, and leaving a review.